I was born in Chile, in Santiago, Chile. But we moved to the U.S. shortly after. By the time I was five, we were in the U.S. because my parents left after the coup um, in early 1974. They left Chile and came to the U.S. And then we lived different places in the Midwest. We were in Illinois for a little bit. We were in Nebraska for a few years. Then we moved to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And that's where my interest in, in art sort of, you know, started because my mother was really excited that we were moving to Washington, D.C. because of the Smithsonian. So she already knew that museum culture was a big deal there, and she was very excited about that and the National Gallery with all of its treasures. And so once we moved to the suburbs of, of D.C., before she had a job, she started, you know, she started looking for a job immediately. It was my dad whose job had moved us there, so she needed to find a job. But before that, she started volunteering at the National Gallery of Art, just on the weekends at the information desk. And when she started to do that and started to talk about it, I became really interested. I was still in high school. And I asked my mother if they thought maybe I could become a volunteer at the National Gallery also. And um, they granted me permission. Apparently, I was the youngest person they'd ever accepted into the volunteer program, which is so funny because now so many museums have really great teen volunteer programs, you know. But this was in the 1980s. So uh, just like her, I worked on Sunday afternoons every other week and mostly sort of told people where the exhibitions were, how to get to specific places. What I loved about that is hearing people who wanted to come in and see a specific artwork that they had been wanting to see. One of the favorite ones was this great 19th century series of four paintings by Thomas Cole called The Voyage of Life. And it's these four canvases that, you know, a little kitschy, but fantastic images of man in his youth and then middle age and then old age, really great. Or um, Watson and the Shark by Copley, which was also a, you know, a big favorite. And so that made me think about a career maybe in, in art. Um, okay. Oh, so when I got to college, you know, the, the advisor was like, well, you're not going to do anything with an undergraduate degree in art history. She said, you know that, right? If you choose this route, you must go all the way through graduate school. She said, I don't mean an MA. She said, I mean a PhD. And then I thought, Oh, I could, you know, why not? I, li I liked school. I'm a geek. I always liked school. I liked being in class. Um, and so I did, and I was lucky. You know, University of Maryland College Park was my home school. I could take the public bus from my parents' house to the university. And, you know, being Chilean, my mother did not want me to leave the house and move to college the way every other 18-year-old American kid did. So she had said to me, you can apply to any school that's local, but you're living at home during college. And so I had applied to Georgetown and University of Maryland. And University of Maryland, it turned out, had one of the top 10 art history programs in the country at a public university. So it was fortuitous all around. And it was a fantastic undergraduate program. I took pre-Columbian art history with um, Professor Arthur can't remember his last name. I'll have to look it up. Anyway, and I told him I was really interested in um, Mesoamerican art and archaeology. And I asked him where he thought I should study to get my master's degree and, you know, where should I go? And he said, well, Mary Elizabeth Smith is teaching Mischek Manuscript Painting, the history of Mischek Manuscript Painting at Tulane University. You should go there. So I applied to Tulane, and I got accepted to the art history program. When I got there and I talked to Professor Smith, she said, you know, the whole colonial period is wide open, as she said, and so is the 19th century. She said, no one's doing any work on it. She said, if you think you don't want to do the archaeological part of Mesoamerican art history, um, you could do something like in the colonial period or the 19th century. And so that got me thinking, you know, I was interested in Mesoamerican art also, but I wanted something a little bit more modern. And so I thought about doing colonial uh, Latin American art. And I took um, as many courses as I, I could in colonial in general, even US. And then did my master's thesis on um, uh, crucifixion sculpture 
that's in Chile that's been there since the 17th, 18th century. And it, you know, through the research found it was based on models originally from Spain that came to the New World through Peru and then were disseminated through the rest of the Americas. And then when I was finished with that, I really wanted to do something even more modern. I really wanted to focus on the 20th century. So I started to do a little research to see which were the best art history programs that were giving PhDs in Latin American art. And in the early 1990s, there were almost none. There was UCLA, uh, because David Kunzel was teaching there. And I applied to the CUNY Graduate Center only because I knew Jacqueline Barnett, who had written the book on the history of Latin American art. She'd written the first sort of survey text. She went to CUNY Grad Center. And I said, oh, this place must be progressive if they let this woman get a degree in whatever, and she's writing the book on Latin American art history. Um, and I got admitted to both UCLA and CUNY, but CUNY was much closer to home. You know, it was a four-hour bus ride, and they gave me a full scholarship. They had this minority access grant to higher education, and so that's how I got through graduate school. And even with the little money they gave me, it was enough to live in Washington Heights. At first, I was going to live in the dorm rooms at CUNY, but... I realized I could rent an apartment in Washington Heights for just a little bit more than the dorm room would have cost in Midtown, you know. And I loved CUNY because I could see, I mean, the history of the school is very progressive and kind of lefty. And it was founded as a school for people who had full-time jobs and wanted to also have get a, a PhD, you know, in the evenings or on weekends. And the professors were fantastic. All the students were like walking bibliographies. I was so glad I had a master's degree because I couldn't imagine going into that program without it already, you know. And what was great about CUNY is that in the end, they allowed me to graduate with what they, you know, I sort of coined the, the name of the degree was going to be like a PhD in art history of the Americas with an S on the end. I had to write a letter petitioning the school to allow me to call my degree History of the Americas because they had a History of American Art. They had someone teaching pre-Columbian art um, who sometimes would teach a 20th century Mexican painting course, but that was it. There was no one really. So Jacqueline Barnett had gone to school there but done all her own reading in order to be able to specialize in Latin American art. And so I looked at modernist movements in the Americas I was interested in, originally, Harlem, Havana, Mexico City, Lima, Santiago, and Sao Paulo as kind of evidence of a, a, a global, or let's say hemispheric modernism that was made evident through especially the body of color and women in particular. But my advisor, who was Jack Flam, said, you know, that's too many cities. He said, why don't you narrow it down? He said, you could do one chapter that's sort of like a survey of those, but maybe think about what could be more specific in your studies. So I picked two artists from Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance period, and two artists from Havana. So the Harlem artists were uh, Aaron Douglas and Jacob Lawrence, and the artists working in Havana were Carlos Enriquez and Wilfredo Olam. And I just looked at specific bodies of their works. Um, sometimes it was just one series that they had done, uh, and how they used the, a kind of image of cultural nationalism that was based in race and gender. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in that period in general, 1925 to 1945, really interested me. And then once I finished school, I was interested in really more in contemporary art also. I was also really lucky I got two other grants that really helped. I, was, um, I got a one-year fellowship at the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian Latino um, Center is an entity of the Smithsonian that doesn't have a physical museum space, but they get money to redistribute within the Smithsonian for Latino projects, US Latino projects. And I applied, and even though the two artists that were my US-based artists were not Latino, <laughs> they gave me a grant. So I was there for a year. I got to do research at the Library of Congress anytime I needed, at the National Gallery. I had all of the Smithsonian archives at my disposal. And of course, what was most useful is the Library of Congress. They had a lot of Cuban material, especially my whole period was before the revolution, so a lot of that material was already in the collection and made it very easy. And when I finished that year at the Smithsonian, I had applied to another internship at the National Gallery that was an internship that would allow me to work in 
a specific project with them. And at the time, they were working on the Romary Bearden retrospective exhibition. So the curator asked if I would do a sort of chronology of his life and look at, look at his you know, year-to-year -year life and how it changed for the catalog. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the chronology of his life for that book while I was there for a year. Mm -hmm. And then the College Art Association had this fantastic fellowship that was a two-year fellowship. So the first year, they would give you a little bit of money to help you finish your dissertation research. And the second year, you would get a museum job, which they would partially fund. And my grant came from the uh, Geraldine Dodge Foundation, which is based in New Jersey. Everyone says they're like the fairy godmother of New Jersey cultural institutions because they're you know, one of the main funders in the state. And they had given the money to the College Art Association to bring one of these fellows to a small museum in Jersey City that needed an assistant curator. And that's how I got that position, that my first curatorial position really was uh, paid, at least was at Jersey City Museum through the College Art Association. And I stayed there. I loved Jersey City Museum. I loved the environment. Um, I loved the artist scene there. I loved the collection. It had a mission that was important to me, which was to look at the diversity of Jersey City as a way to um, speak to the audiences that were there. So they were always, they had always been very attentive to making sure that the exhibitions were filled with art artists from all kinds of backgrounds. And so I stayed for almost 10 years. And um, that was sort of the beginning. I had done private, previous curatorial projects with a friend, you know, where we didn't get paid and someone wanted to have an art show in their house. <laughs> And could we put some Dominican and Haitian artists together to make a show? So we had done stuff like that. And that was my initial yeah. sort of thinking about visiting artists and talking to them about their work and then putting shows together that way. Mm -hmm. The original mission of El Museo actually was even more, it was very specific. The museum had been founded to display the work of the Puerto Rican diaspora. So it was specifically a New Eurekan institution founded by someone who identified as a New Eurekan, an artist, Rafael Montañez Ortiz. And he really thought about it being a, na a, a museum for the neighborhood, mm -hmm. which at that time was filled with people who were, many of whom were born in New York and raised in East Harlem, or who had come with their families very young. Their families had immigrated to East Harlem, but it was a, it was a diasporic experience. So it wasn't people who necessarily um, went back and forth. They really had an American experience, right? So that was the initial idea, and the, and, and the, ex, the exhibitions would be focused on a broad understanding of culture. So, for example, there was a really early exhibition on Puerto Rican women's needlepoint work. Mm -hmm. um, and then it grew very quickly into an, ex, a, an institution that wanted to respond to other groups of Latin Americans who were present in New York. Nobody as early as the Puerto Ricans. I mean, really, they were the first ones to arrive in New York at early in the 20th century, and then even more so towards the 40s and 50s. Um, but gradually, already, I would say, by the late 50s, definitely by the early 60s, there was a growing population of Dominicans arriving in New York City. And um, throughout the 70s, that population really boomed. Uh, to where it's definitely in competition with the largest subcategory of Latinos living in New York City. Between Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, the numbers are very close. And I would say over the last 10 years, especially the last five years, the immigrant community in East Harlem has um, included a lot of new Mexican immigrants, and specifically from Puebla. People tell the joke that everybody from Puebla moved to East Harlem. Um, and another really interesting statistic that I heard recently, the mayor's office was doing studies of neighborhoods and, and private and small businesses. And it turns out that while Mexicans still are probably only about 10% of the population in East Harlem, they own 40% of the businesses. So they really are um, expanding their, their businesses in East Harlem a lot. There's a lot of new little Mexican restaurants there's even fusion restaurants. I just saw one the other day. It was Mexican and Italian fusion. 
um, the other day on 116th Street, we walked by a store that sold um, cowboy boots and that kind of Western regalia that uh, is favored by some Mexican populations. So you see the imprint in the neighborhood, which is interesting. You know, we have family days once a month. It's always uh, the third Saturday month, Super Sábado. And that's when a lot of families come. Everything's free. We start in the morning at 11 o'clock. We have programming all afternoon for families and kids of all ages. And that's when a lot of people from the neighborhood come to see the galleries, but also to see musical performances and um, do face painting when it's our, our Day of the Dead celebration, uh, hands-on workshops for the children. So there's a mix of everything. And I'd say you know that the museum has tried to be attentive to responding to the changing demographics of the neighborhood. But we are still very cognizant of the fact that being founded by New Yorkans makes it important to think about how much Puerto Rican presence is still in the museum. You know, for example, we just finished an exhibition on the Young Lords, and this was a project that really the Bronx Museum was going to do, and I approached the curator, who was my friend, and said, we have to participate in the Young Lords exhibition. It would be a terrible mistake if we didn't. The Young Lords were founded in East Harlem. They did a lot of their political activity in East Harlem. And so we mounted this great exhibition with very little money and relying a lot of what was in our permanent collection that looked at this history of Puerto Rican activism and photographs from the official photographer of the Young Lords, Hiram Maristani. And that was a super well-attended show and the community, the neighborhood especially, really appreciated that we had put these images of Puerto Rican activism from the 60s and 70s into the museum gallery. You know, treating it as artwork and as something of cultural importance. So I think we're always um, thinking about how we can maintain that commitment to the originators of the museum. Mm -hmm. The idea of contextualizing the exhibitions and the artworks we're showing are, is really important to us. And so is things like labels. You know, I mean, I just last week I went to see the one of the exhibitions at one of the major institutions in New York, and I was surprised to see how little information there was next to each work about the works themselves and why they're important. I mean, that's something that we would never do. You know, every artwork gets an extended label in English and in Spanish, which at this point is almost like a political gesture because I think most of our audience reads the English version, but it's important to us to do it. Um, so that's one thing that we're very committed to. We also have a director of education who is a philosopher. And so she has a real interest in philosophical questions related to art and how you can engage the viewer longer than the six seconds, which is the average that a viewer spends in front of a work of art, by posing additional object labels or labels next to, in a section, for example, that might ask a question about you know, what the artist is doing in the work and how does that relate to some aspect of daily life or to history. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about how to engage the viewer on a deeper level in front of individual works of art. Um, and then in addition, I think one of the other things we've always, especially I would say in the last 10 years, have thought about contextualizing Latin American art in general in a more global context by looking at relationships between artists from the rest of the, let's say, hem hemispheric relationships. So, you know, artists from the Americas who are traveling, they were going to go to Paris because that was their, the art mecca in the 20s, and they stopped in New York on the way, and then they never left New York because it was such a um, hotbed of artistic, you know, practice also. We look, we've looked at those relationships and thought about um, what that meant, a Latin American artist engaging with an Anglo-American artist and working on projects together, or influences that were, you know, between the two different kinds of groups. In 2009, we had a great exhibition organized by Deborah Cohen uh, that looked, it was called Nexus New York, and it was a study of the period between about 1910 and 1945, looking specifically at artists from Mexico, Uruguay, um, Chile, several, Dominican Republic, Cuba, several places, artists who had come to New York to study, sometimes with American artists at the Art Students League especially, 
um, and looked at the projects that they did as a result, you know, things that they did in New York. And that's, I think, a really good example of how you can think about art history in a more global way and not reduce it to just the history of Latin American art, but looking at more, more specifically at relationships that were formed by, by artists, which is how re you really work. You don't work in national lines necessarily. You work with the, your local experience, but you also have interaction with other artists from other parts of the world. So it seems more logical, I think, to think about projects in that way. There's the Mexican Museum in Chicago, and then there's the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, California. And then there's the new Perez Art Museum of Miami, which has now changed their focus to be on the Americas and the, or the Caribbean. They're saying the Americas and the Caribbean specifically because they feel like, or rightly so, Miami is sort of like this portal between the rest of the Americas and the United States. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. But I'm not sure if it's sort of unique, what, you know, to El Museo. But I do think it maybe has to do even with the diversity of New York and thinking about people more broadly, you know. Also, since the 90s maybe, El Museo has not done national shows. I mean, I remember one that was just about Puerto Rican artists working on the island and in New York in the diaspora. So it's th it was three artists from each um, location. That might have been the last show that just focused on a specific country. And that even made sense because Puerto Ricans were our founders, right? But we get um, emails every month, maybe sometimes more often, um, from curators in other countries or local curators offering shows of Argentine women artists or um, Cuban artists or, you know, Ecuadorian was the most recent one I got. You know, and while there's nothing wrong with that, we feel it is a little bit maybe limiting to the artists that are in the show, but also for our audiences. It's more interesting, I think, to think about a broader theme mm -hmm. and to incorporate artists from all over into that, which is the way we've been working for the last 10 or 15 years. The question of kind of accessibility or visibility of Latin American artists in New York in general you know, everyone keeps saying that maybe even since 1992, Latin American art is hot and it's the next big thing and there's a big market in, you know, big art market, even a secondary market already. But I still feel that there is, there remains a kind of invisibility and a, and a lack of resources being put towards, for example, large solo exhibitions for major Latin American artists, which is not happening with, I mean, how many more Picasso shows can there be? But it seems like they're endless. Jasper Johns, Andy Warhol, all these people have had a million, a million solo shows and large museum retrospectives. Um, they're endless. They can just be repeated over and over and over again. And then, for example, a woman who really deserves, she's a pioneer of avant-garde art in the Americas and a major figure all over. Marta Minujin has yet to have a solo retrospective in New York. Carmen Herrera, a Cuban artist who came to New York early, maybe in the 40s, she was, she was one of the artists who delivered works from Cuba to the Museum of Modern Art when they were organizing their show in 1944 called Cuban Painting of Today. And she was sort of like the courier and stayed in New York. Um, and only now, she's close to 100, is having a, a solo retrospective at the Whitney Museum. So um, I feel that there's still you know, uh, a void, let's say, in some larger institutions. Although, in New York, at least, there's much less of that kind of a void um, visible, partly because El Museo is there and partly because there are, because schools like Yale and Columbia make sure that they do admit some Latino students so they can get their MFAs. Identified Those artists can. are lucky enough sometimes to get a solo gallery show in New York um, or launch a career, you know, but they're sort of the exception to the rule.
you know what? I was just rethinking my last answer, you know, about the um, relationships from with Latin American artists and other, and were there other institutions that worked that way? This year also, the Museum of Modern Art, actually late 2015, the Museum of Modern Art organized a really great exhibition on Latin. This was all taken from the permanent collection too, so it was amazing to see what they had in storage and they never show. It was a show that looked at the relationship, or not necessarily relationship, but let's say the affinities between art produced in Eastern Europe and art produced in the Americas in the 1960s and 1970s. It was called Transmissions. Um, and that's, I think, the perfect kind of project, actually, for a large institution to do, to show that there's not, artists aren't working in isolation, that you could pick two different parts of the world during political period. Yeah. Just there's this eternal question about categorization of artists and self-naming as opposed to a government entity naming your, your uh, race or ethnicity. And the tension between uh, Latin American and Latino as terms for people working in any field, right? Um, I think, you know, if we lived in an ideal world and people weren't judged, even before they appear on your front doorstep by the way their name looks, it would be a different experience, right? But artists from those parts of the world don't have that advantage. They send their resume somewhere and people are uh, um, automatically know in which category to put them. So while the terms Latin American and Latino are totally imperfect, and as one person said to me recently, racist, because they sort of um, delete this indigenous presence, and let's not even forget the African presence, um, that by saying Latino, we're really taking up a kind of a neo-colonial um, way of in the works that they're producing. And that becomes um, a way of including or excluding, and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with race or ethnicity or even gender.